Good evening, everyone. We're delighted to welcome you all back for this, our second and final class session of an indigenous history of the Upper Great Lakes region with your instructor, Professor Patty Lowe of Northwestern University. Since class a week ago, you should have received an email from me with the link to the recording of that class along with the annotated chat log. Uh, if you didn't get it, I've put the link to the recorded session in chat now, so you should find it at the top of the, of the chat log. Uh, earlier, you should have received a resource list prepared by Professor Lowe um, for those who want to pursue issues discussed in this class more deeply. If you didn't receive any of these, please send me your email in the chat log addressed to me rather than to everyone, and I'll take care of it. We will be doing the same after this evening's class, also sending out the complete chat log from tonight's session with responses from Professor Lowe. I was very grateful to see how many people acknowledged uh, you know, that this was a significant contribution to the class, and we're all very grateful to Professor Lowe for having done this. So this evening, please use chat to ask questions and make comments. What doesn't get an answer this evening we will get to afterward. Again, thanks to both Evanston Public Library and the Northwestern Emeriti Organization for making our series of mini courses possible. Uh, over the summer, we will uh, pause, but we will be back next fall with a wholly new lineup. Your comments and suggestions for next year are welcome. So with that, I'm turning the screen over now to Professor Patty Lowe of Northwestern for tonight's class. Patty, over to you. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate everybody that showed up last week and um, I appreciate you coming back and uh, thank you again for inviting me. Um, I, uh, I also want to acknowledge that we're meeting on the ancestral lands of the um, Anishinaabe, the Three Fires Confederacy, as well as the Miami, the Ho-Chunk, um, the uh, Menominee as well, and the three fires consist of Ojibwe, that's me, uh, Potawatomi and Odawa. So I'm gonna start sharing my screen here and um, make sure that everything is optimized, starting where I left off last, last week. Um, so I have to do one more thing and hide this little floating thing here. Um, hide floating media. Okay, so I hope you see a slide that says Indigenous History of the Upper Great Lakes Region. And this is where we're going to begin today. So, um, a number of Native nations of the Upper Great Lakes Region, the Ho Chunk, Menominee, 21 bands of Ojibwe, we have the Great Lakes surrounded four bands of Potawatomi, a um, couple of them in Michigan, a couple of them in Wisconsin, the Oneida and Stockbridge Muncie Band of Mohican Indians who traveled to, uh, to the Great Lakes region in the 1820s, the Odawa, the Sioux, I'm not going to talk much about the Sioux there, uh, the Dakota were in Western Wisconsin, now in present day Minnesota, and uh, the Brother Town who are not federally recognized, um, and they're a Wisconsin tribe. So 12 Native nations in Wisconsin, primarily in the northern part of the state, um, 12 Native nations in Michigan. Um, some of these are not federally recognized. There are 11 Native nations in Minnesota. And um, you'll have a, um, a copy of this video. So if you want to check out the maps that you can go back and take a look specifically at where these nations are located. Um, the Ho-Chunk. Uh, I'm going to start with them because they have a continuous, a continuous presence in the Great Lakes region. And um, if you look up here, uh, that's Nicolay um, arriving uh, on the shores of Mogachouche, which is present day Green Bay. That's where the Ho-Chunk originally um, were from. And uh, Nicolay thought he was in Asia, and so he put on his best Chinese robes. And the Ho-Chunk and Potawatomi are uh, greeting him. 
they spring the Ho Chunks have oral history that talks about sprinkling tobacco on Nicolay's forehead as a way of welcoming him. And then he fired off his guns called thunder sticks. And uh, that's how the Ho Chunk described them, uh, which scared the um, living um, daylights out of them. And they still talk about that even today. You can see the Ho Chunk um, are flung uh, across the middle part, the north central part of uh, Wisconsin and administer communities across 12 counties, which makes administration pretty difficult. Um, the railroad went from Chicago to Wisconsin Dells and the Ho-Chunk learned pretty early on the value of tourism, but it was kind of a double-edged sword because the Chicago tourists arrived with no knowledge of who native people were and they expected to see war bonnets and totem poles, um, which of course is not part of the Ho-Chunk um, tradition. And, uh, but the Ho-Chunk learned pretty quickly to start carving totem poles and wearing war bonnets and posing for penny, photo, uh, penny postcards uh, with the tourists. Um, and they're still, you know, even today, they're doing um, a, a pretty nice business with their gaming facility in, uh, in a couple of areas in Wisconsin, but primarily in the Wisconsin Dells area. And I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit later about mining because the Ho-Chunk have been trying to get rid of sand mines in their, in their community. The Menominee are uh, another continuously residing people in, in uh, the northeast, what's northeastern Wisconsin. Um, you can see they're located uh, north and west from Green Bay. And this is uh, this map here, um, this aerial map, you can see how densely forested their reservation is. When we talked, remember we talked about allotment, this privatization of native nations back in, eight, it began before 1887, but the General Allotment Act was 1887. And the Menominee successfully petitioned the federal government not to allot them. They didn't see their future in for farming. They uh, already operated some small portable um, mills and they saw their future in wood products. So they were not allotted um, and unfortunately, and, and set themselves up by congressional act on a sustainable yield basis. They were the, the first ones to do sustainable forestry. Um, and this was back in 19, you know, the early part of the 1900s. Um, but the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the US Forest Service acting in concert with some unscrupulous lumber barons um, began clear cutting. And eventually the Menominee sued and successfully won an eight and a half million dollar judgment in the 1950s, which got them terminated. And remember last week we talked about the federal trust um, obligation where the federal government is legally required to act in the best interests of native nations. By terminating the tribe, they um, didn't have to keep any of their treaty promises. They didn't have to act in the best interest. They're, it's a really long, painful, complicated story. But um, when it was over, the Menominee were terminated in the 1950s. They lost their hospital. There was this tremendous brain drain. They lost um, some of their reservation land. And eventually they were able to get their reservation status back and are once again viewed as a sovereign nation by the United States government. Um, and now they're able to operate their, um, manage their forest the way they had always managed it sustainably. And you can see this picture that was taken by one of the space shuttles. Um, this is such a dense, beautiful forest, 400 some different species of trees, trees that are almost 500 years old. It's absolutely gorgeous. If you ever have a chance to visit the Menominee Forest, please do it. It's just north of Shawano, Wisconsin. Um, some of you expressed, a lot of you actually expressed an interest in language. And so I, I had, uh, have a couple of vid videos that I wanna play for you. They're quite short, they're only four minutes. This one always, you know, just makes me, brings a tear to my eye. Um, 
the Menominee are down to eight first speakers. Um, the boarding schools uh, had a devastating effect on the Menominee and there are eight speakers left. There are some folks, younger folks that are trying to learn the language. This is a young dad who decided to stay at home and teach his three-year-old uh, the Menominee language. I first go around and plow my relatives out, a couple of aunties and cousins. Then I have my, I call them brothers, you know. That's the way we say it in our language, in Amatuk, our friends, you know, close friends. We do things in, in a good mind and a good heart and a good way. And when we need that help, I guess we believe it will come to us too. <laughs> What I'm doing is ensuring that the language goes a generation beyond myself. Um, and I'm gonna do that through my kids, you know. I'm teaching Mimikwa the language using natural immersion. Natural immersion is you just talk about your day the way you would anything else, you know, so. Only it's being done in Menominee. I decided to stay home and teach her the language because it's a, my last unique opportunity to be able to raise a first language fluent speaker. I think it's hard for her to, to want to speak because nobody else does, you know. There's probably about eight people that speak. We'll call it 10, you know. She got 10 of 10,000, you know. What's that percent? 0.001, you know, 0.001%. So that's a, a reality check. The language, it could die, but the idea that we're trying to preserve is a living language. But it lives. So there's words readily available for everything in nature. The word for falling snow is petnon. And the word for snow on the ground is cone. Crusted snow, wana, you know, we say wana. And the word snowflake is even different yet than both of them. We say, uh, pewe, the beautiful thing is it's that much easier in, in the woods, you know, because our language is really based on what, what's going on out there. But how do we make that transition into today's life too, you know, because we're not always sugaring, we're not always ricing. Spend a lot of days at home, in the office, on the road, and we got to learn to express those things too, you know. The language has to make that transition if it's going to be relevant and if it's going to survive, you know. When I was young, my first main teacher, Watsichiwan, she was starting to get sick and forgetful, you know. One day we were just sitting at her house talking, and she tells me, uh, now I can die, she told me. For 25 years, she said, try to teach someone this language. Now today I've done that. Then she continued on in Menominee, you know, she said, I'm gonna put your kitchen in you and the saw and you pick it off to go to eat your nox, go peek it to it. She said, Pon nini da. She said, get 
the Hapana, she told me. She says, you know, maybe you're going to be an old man, she says, when you, you hear these kids talking our language. She said, I love you. Don't give up. You can see how um, how uh, painful it is, how much anxiety there is to think that your language is going to die and all your ceremonies, all your traditional ecological knowledge, which is embedded in that language. Um, it's, it's, it's a monumental challenge for tribal communities. So I wanted to um, share what one community is doing. The Ojibwe have set up a school, an immersion school. And um, so this next video uh, is, is their efforts and it's been pretty successful. It's been going on now for about 15 years and, um, and they're graduating kids. Lots of families are sending their kids there and it's, uh, uh, I was at a State of the Tribes address at the Wisconsin Capitol a couple of years ago, and there were some sixth graders who de delivered the invocation in Ojibwe, and I think half of us in the peanut gallery up in the upper seats were in tears. I'll play that. This is a, a school called Wadoka Dotting, and uh, it's on the Lakuta Reservation in northwestern Wisconsin. the number of existing elders who spoke Ojibwe fluently, who were raised with Ojibwe as a first language, were vastly diminishing. So we knew we had to do something quick. And so that's why we started Wadukudating. <laughs> Wadukudating, it's a place where our language lives, where the Ojibwe language lives. Language, I think with any cultural practice, it has a specific vocabulary and teachings that are associated with each activity in that practice. So for instance, all the words about boiling sap the way that it boils, have specific terms that describe it very, very accurately that allow you to develop a deep comprehension of the activity and why you do it and how you do it. Oma, when did you on Zinzaba Kodabu Mitigong? We could be doing a kina Zinzaba Kodabu, a king da a tamagad. I always say it's a, an educational experience for for students, but it's a, it's a community movement. We're facing some really unique challenges right now. We have a lot of statistics that are against us, that we have a lot of issues with abuse and suicide that show us as not being the most healthy of communities. And I always think of it not just in terms of our culture surviving, but really our people surviving. <laughs> I didn't learn to speak Ojibwe as a child, but when I started studying it as an adult in college, I quickly realized how much knowledge and capacity there is in a language to know who you are, where you come from, how to see the world in that unique way. I'm <laughs> <laughs>
It's certainly academically rigorous. It's not just a culture program. It's not just a language program. Ultimately, it's prepping them and building an intellectual framework that they'll be able to apply to and adapt to no matter where they are in, in the world that will help them. And I think they're prepared with knowledge and ability that they feel proud of, that they feel connected to their ancestry in a deeper way. They have a much broader and deeper understanding of Ojibwe perspective in relation to the local community, the local environment, and the world. All right, so there are um, six Ojibwe bands in Wisconsin, and I wanted to, uh, and they're all located in the north, extreme northern part of Wisconsin. There's my reservation right there, Bad River. I wanted to uh, point out this um, pictograph. The word Ojibwe um, means to script. There's a couple of different, it also may mean to pucker, which may relate to our moccasins, but it, the root word it may come from the word to script because our pictographic language became the lingua, uh, lingua franca of the French fur trade. So um, we had signed these treaties, which you're gonna see in the next slide. And we had um, been told that we could, you know, if we signed these treaties, we could stay in the land that became Wisconsin. And of course that was a, a promise that wasn't kept to us. And in 1848, we got wind that the president then, Ulyss, um, my, my, Zachary Taylor, um, was going to remove us west of the Mississippi River. So we sent a delegation of chiefs and headmen to Washington with this um, pictograph, which the, each of the characters here represent an Ojibwe clan. And you can see the eye of uh, our principal chief is, um, it comes from the Crane clan. And you can see the eye of the crane is connected to the eyes of each of the other clan figures, the Martins, the, the um, bear, the medicine figure and the fish clan. And um, the crane's heart also is connected by lines um, to the, the other clan figures. The thick blue line here represents Lake Superior and these small dots here represent our wild rice. And what this pictograph is telling Washington is that the Ojibwe are of one mind and one heart. Don't move us to new lands because we need to be here in our homes on the south shore of Lake Superior because we have to be near our wild rice beds. So these are the, um, the treaties that we signed. And unlike most Indian nations, we insisted that we retain the right to hunt fish and gather rice upon the waters is the way it was phrased in the treaties that we signed. Um, most tribes didn't do that. And um, unfortunately, when Minnesota, Wisconsin and Michigan became states, they just assumed that um, statehood nullified these federal treaties, which as we found out in the 1970s was not the case. And when we began exercising our treaty rights um, during the Red Power Movement in the 70s, this is what we encountered on the boat landings. This is from a national newscast back in 1989. With sports fishing season opening today in Wisconsin, police were out in force to head off fights between fishermen using rods and reels and Indians who got a two week head start with the spotlights and spears that only they are allowed to use. Gary Reeves now reports on that. Fishing for walleye pike on the lakes of northern Wisconsin is supposed to be peaceful. But the rod and reel fishing season was kicked off with a near riot last night when a thousand angry fishermen protested against Indians exercising their right to spearfish. More than a hundred were arrested. 
for the Chippewa, spearfishing is protected under treaties signed in the 1800s. But every night since their season opened two weeks ago, they have been harassed by people upset that the Indians get a head start and can take 60% of this year's legal catch. I'm going to get out of this here for the sake of time, but I wanted you to see what it looked like. I was a reporter for an ABC affiliate and for PBS Wisconsin at the time and covered the boat landing violence, and it was truly horrifying. Um, one of the things that unfortunately happened uh, is that the initial news media coverage, especially the television report, uh, reporting, really focused on the conflict and the, the cultural expression behind spearfishing never came out. And so I wanted you to be able to um, take a look at, at why spearfishing is so important to the Ojibwe people. We'd like to arrive at the landing before sun sets to ensure that we have a permit, but we really can't start fishing until it's dark enough to be able to use the headlamps. If the fishing is good, we'll be on the water until we have all the fish that our permits allow us to take. I give tobacco for those water spirits and I ask for safety. I love having Samuel and Benisi in the boat. I love seeing young Ojibwe men becoming providers for their family. It's like the opportunities I was given by my older brothers. I started in the late 80s fishing with my brothers. There were certain lakes that they wouldn't take me on, lakes that they knew that there was going to be trouble. They didn't necessarily want me to witness the racial slurs and stuff getting thrown at us and things like that. Now that I have my own boys fishing with us, I understand why they did that. The spearing controversy for some people will probably always be there. They just don't understand why we do this. Spearing happens in very shallow water. The fish always determine when we're allowed to spear. When the lake reaches a certain temperature, that triggers the spawn and the fish will come in. Basically what we're looking for is a reflection of a walleye's eye. It'll illuminate a little bit, and that way you can pick it out. This is a hot spot here. For us, anytime we fish or hunt, maybe there's a little bit of sport in it, but the actual taking something, whether it's wild rice or, or syrup or a fish or a deer. Being able to take those things, being able to go out and harvest fish means that I can be a contributing member of the community. We've fished for elders. We've fished for single mothers. We always try to give as much as we can away. There's a lot of honor in that. When I drive the boat, I always worry about a lot of different things, you know, obstacles in the water. I worry about trees hanging over. I worry about docks and private property. We've had people standing on docks saying things. We've had people shine lights at us, throw rocks at us. It's always in the back of your head. But in the same respect, you know, we've had a lot of people that are just curious and seem very supportive and very interested in what we do. Even though our techniques have maybe changed a little bit, knowing that that fish coming off a long winter is something that all the Ojibwe people that came before us since the creation of the world tasted the exact same fish that we taste now. We live in an Americanized society 
and the federal government has wanted us to assimilate. And for a large part, we are, you know. But then there's also the other side. The Ojibwe education is something we have to have to survive as Ojibwe. Tasting that fish is part of that, having that living history. I spear fish because I'm Ojibwe. That's who we are, and that's what we do. Um, I remember many nights being in a fishing boat with my camera, and I learned from my first experience not to put myself between the spear and the fish bucket because the spear goes in and, and I'm shooting it and the fish goes over me and all the ice and cold, and wet and blood and guts. So uh, there's definitely a way to shoot <laughs> spear fishing properly. And I learned that quickly after my first experience. So we also have the Potawatomi. We have uh, Potawatomi Reservation is in Northern Wisconsin. Also, they have a gaming facility in Milwaukee. There's also the um, Potawatomi in Southwestern uh, Michigan, the um, Pekagan Potawatomi. I'll mention them again in just a little bit. Uh, one of the things that's really kind of cool about the Potawatomi is they are generating so much energy through alternative energy sources. Their casino in Milwaukee is almost off the grid. Um, they have uh, LED lights in their um, parking lot. There are tribal administration buildings. It's all, they, they were doing um, compact fluorescence way before any of us had ever heard that term before. They do four day work weeks. Um, uh, they're, everything is energy star related, uh, rated. They're doing, they're leading the country in municipalities in terms of, uh, of being green. The Oneida are um, one of the two tribes. The, the Oneida are uh, Haudenosaunee people, the, um, also called the Five Nations or Six Nations Confederacy, the Iroquois Confederacy. Generally, I don't use that term because it's a disparaging term that my tribe gave them. Um, but after the Revolutionary War, despite the fact that they were allied with the United States, against the British. They were pushed out of New York. Um, the, there was an unscrupulous governor who uh, basically hoodwinked them into signing leases and treaties, which as we know from last session, um, treaty making is a federal power. States do not have the right to um, enter into treaties with anybody, including native people. But the state of New York did, and um, and there was a large land, land claims uh, case in the mid 2000s, which the Oneida lost. And um, interestingly enough, one of my favorite justices, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, actually invoked the doctrine of discovery in ruling against the Oneida. Um, I was told by someone at a, a speech a couple of weeks ago that she um, actually kind of uh, said it was one of the decisions that she regretted the most. Um, but uh, unfortunately, the Oneida lost their uh, their land and and such in New York. And um, yeah, they're they're moving forward. They do have some of the tribe is still in New York, but um, most of the tribal members are now in Wisconsin um, in in a, a situation that's really kind of interesting because the Oneida, the original Oneida reservation um, is, uh, I don't know how to, um, there are at least four townships, maybe more that have been carved out over the Oneida reservation. So there's the city of Green Bay, the town of Ashwaubenon, the town of De Pere, the town of Hobart, Brown County. There are all these competing jurisdictions and it really is a nightmare from, uh, from an administrative perspective. The Stockbridge Muncie uh, band of Mohican Indians uh, traveled with the Oneida in the 1820s as well. Um, 
the Menominee were forced into a treaty and forced to give up vast tracts of their land. And the treaty says, treaty with the Menominee for the benefit of the New York Indians. And the Stockbridge Muncie, when everything shook out, uh, were bounced around a couple of places in Wisconsin, but wound up being allowed to purchase uh, the southwestern portion of the Menominee Reservation in um, Menominee County. The Brothertown were also a New York uh, group. These were a, an amalgamated, Christianized group of seven Let's see, I have to count the feathers. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, seven Christianized remnant bands of Pequot, of Narragansett, of Niantic, um, Stonington, Farmington. Um, and these were, were Christianized Indians who banded together in brotherhood, which is why they call themselves Brother Town. And after the, Revo the American Revolution, they, um, they went to live with the Oneida, but the Oneida were already being pushed out of the, the state of New York. And so the brother town also came to Wisconsin at the same time. Of course, it wasn't Wisconsin then. Um, it was still the territory, but um, they came the same time the other two New York bands did. And um, the brother town were so concerned about losing their land that they accepted citizenship and allotment in the 1830s and ceased to exist formally as native people. Of course, they know they're still Indian, but the federal government does not recognize them as a sovereign nation. They have one acre of land in downtown Fond du Lac and um, basically their Indian nation is held together with, by you know Sunday small stakes bingo and bake sales. Um, so allotment didn't work for them and um, citizenship didn't either, and they've been trying to get their federal recognition back, but because they were, they were um, terminated by act of Congress, it will take an act of Congress to get them reinstated, and it doesn't seem that there's political will to do that right now. I mentioned the Pekagan Band of Potawatomi. They are right around the, uh, um, the south shore of Lake Superior, of uh, Lake Michigan, sorry. Um, in the southwestern portion of Michigan, um, almost on the Indiana border. And they've been doing a lot of um, river restoration. They're, um, they've put a lot of effort into food sovereignty, into environmental programs. And um, they have, um, we, we learned last week how they were able to stay in Michigan because their wise chief kept them away from the Treaty of Chicago, where the, you know, the native folks that showed up were uh, really plied with liquor and forced into some really disastrous um, treaty agreements. Um, Pukagan kept his band away from them. He used the money from the Treaty of Chicago to purchase land in Michigan and got some Catholic allies to um, you know, stick up for them and, and they were able to stay in their ancestral lands. We also have to talk about urban Indians because more than, than half, upwards of two thirds of native people now live in cities like Chicago. A lot of people are surprised to learn that there are upwards of 89,000 native people in Chicago and the collar communities. There's almost 130,000 Indians in Illinois, even though there are no federally recognized native nations in Illinois. And in some ways there are more um, job opportunities, more opportunities for education, but in some cases um, there's more health disparities among urban Indians because the Indian Health Service um, doesn't operate facilities in every large city. We're lucky to have the American Indian Health Center here in Chicago, um, but native, native people in cities generally don't have access to the ceremonies and the cultural activities that you would find on a reservation. And it's really difficult to figure out who you are when you're not connected to your, your land. So um, that's a, a unique challenge for urban Indians. So now I wanna get into my sweet spot, um, environmental justice, uh, traditional ecological knowledge and seventh generation philosophy. 
Um, a lot of tribes have this, it's a, an environmental ethic, but for the Ojibwe, it cautions us to make decisions today in the best interest of people seven generations into the future. And uh, one, of my, um, one of my heroes, Walt Brissett, who actually went to school here in Chicago and became a spokesperson for Ojibwe treaty rights, um, was a, a founder of the Lake Superior and Wisconsin Green Party and the author of um, an amendment that didn't pass, but it still, I think, rings, um, it's a hopeful ideal that uh, I think still has some merit today. The right of citizens of the United States to use and enjoy air, water, wildlife, and other renewable resources determined by the Congress to be common property shall not be impaired, nor shall such use impair their availability for the use of future generations. And a lot of us are talking about climate change right now and, and thinking that you know we, we want to leave a better world for our children and grandchildren. And right now, um, we've kind of messed it up. Um, this is one of my favorite quotes from Vine Deloria, who's kind of the godfather of the American Indian Studies movement. The vast majority of Indian tribal religions have a sacred center at a particular place, be it a river, a mountain, a plateau, valley, or other natural feature. This center enables the people to look out along the four dimensions and locate their lands to relate all historical events within the confines of this particular land and to accept responsibility for it. Regardless of what subsequently happened to, happens to the people, the sacred lands remain as permanent fixtures in their cultural or religious understanding. There is a profound piece of wisdom in this. And I think it explains why mainstream society fails to accommodate the sacredness of native land sometimes. Um, and I think it has to do with the concept of, of you know, religion as it's defined by Christianity, Islam and, and Judaism is, um, it's a liturgical kind of religion. So it's, it's event-based. We have Christmas, we have Easter, there are things that happen and we have ceremonies that are um, particular to those events. When you have a nature-based religion, and I'll, and I'll also say the other religions have portable holy items. You can put a rosary in your pocket or a prayer rug over your shoulder, and you can go anywhere in the world and take out those items and do your ceremonies and be a spiritual person. But for nature, na nature native-based, nature-based religions, um, religions like the Medewin and um, Dream Dance and Big, Big Drum, these are religions where people are praying for the land itself. They're not praying for themselves or for their good fortune or their good health or they're praying for the land. And so you can't be spiritual except at that piece of land. And so when legislators, you know, look at a place like Bears Ears and say, oh, it's just a bunch of rocks, um, you know, we can mine or we can, you know, drill or we, um, they don't understand you know, how sacred this place is. Um, when the Ojibwe, when my people were trying to fight a 22 mile long open pit taconite mine at the headwaters of our Rice River, we had a Wisconsin legislator who came up and took a look at the rice and said, what's the big deal? It's just a bunch of, you know, just a bunch of weeds. Not knowing that, you know, rice is part of our origin stories, is part of our creation stories, is part of our treaty making, it's part of our our ceremonial selves. And, um, and that's a disconnect that I think, you know, I see over and over and over again on environmental issues. So some of the threats that are going on right now, uh, the Menominee, for example, there's a uh, Aquila Resources is hoping to site a gold mine less than 100 feet from the Menominee point of origin, the mouth of the Menominee River. And um, recently, a federal judge overturned the permits, which all had been, you know, the final permits had all been approved. Federal judge overturned that. And so now, you know, no mind for now, but that could change. 
the Ho-Chunk Nation has been dealing with um, an exponential rise of, of frac sand mines. There's no hydraulic fracturing there, no fracking, but the sand that's used in the hydraulic fracturing process, um, the best sand, what, what's been described as the Saudi Arabian sand um, for frac sand mining, uh, is in central Wisconsin, right in the, um, the Ho-Chunk ancestral lands. And these, uh, there were uh, fewer than 20 frac sand mines before 2013. And by the end of 2015, when um, sand mining was at its height, um, there were 155 and, um, and the regulations had not kept up with them. And we know that uh, from research that's been done at the University of Minnesota, that sand mines have been associated with silicosis, lung cancers, and some other things. Um, the, the sand mining has slowed down here because there have been some new sand mines that have opened up in West Texas, but it's something that the Ho-Chunk are still dealing with. They've lost some of their artisanal springs um, and uh, sand mining is still a problem. Um, I, I think I told you the story of wild rice, the migration story, we're here, the Ojibwe are here because of the food that grows on water. Um, I'm, I don't think I'm going to have time. Now, maybe I'll, maybe I'll show you this. I'll show you at least part of it. Um, this is our tribal historic preservation officer talking about wild rice in a video that was shot by three 14 year olds in a summer workshop that I, I, I direct um, on my reservation each summer. Generally, rice is a very delicate plant, the manumen. And um, a, a little bit of anything in excess or too less will impact that, that plant. So if something comes in and crowds the root systems of it, that's going to impact the plant. If something, um, if the water level is too high, that's going to impact the plant. If certain uh, birds aren't um, available to it to clean the plant, that's going to impact the plant. When you have all of those things happening at the same time, the plant, it's, it's, probably the most difficult time for that plant to actually live. And uh, how do we help, I think, how do we help that plant to live? Because that plant has sustained us, has helped us to live for so long. The water levels have to be just right. Certain birds need to be there um, in order to, that, that are light enough to, to actually st stand right on the stem of the plant and be able to eat the worms that, that crawl up the plant. Um, the, the area for its growth and its root system, because it grows from a seed, and just like any place where you go and you have to weed plants out of a, a, a garden, it's the same thing. We need people to weed those plants out of that garden of wild rice. I am fearful of how how that's going to impact the future of our people. I can't imagine my grandchildren's grandchildren not knowing what a rice plant looks like or smells like or how to harvest it. And that has happened in certain areas of the lake. It is devastating to me as an Ojibwe woman because that has been our, our culture has surrounded her and built around that in the place that we live. Our connection to this place has been built around that rice. The way we think today has changed so drastically within the past couple hundred years in all cultures that we forget what where are our places in this world? We forget that we are at the lowest level. We are reliant on everything around us in order for us to live. 
And the more we destroy everything around us, the more we are taking our own lives. It's like committing suicide. And being conscious of that uh, way of life, you know, knowing that we do need clean water to drink. That's common fact that everybody knows. Dirty water makes you sick. Do we need to say that so simply that people begin to understand that again? We are becoming reliant on purchasing our water from bottles. Where we could sit here at one time, put our hand right in this water and take a drink. Because the fish species that belonged here, that sturgeon, filtered this water so well that we were able to do that. Looking at the world in a different way helps us to realize that even though we're one person, you know, that one person can affect an entire place. One person can say, yeah, it's okay to take the top of that mountain over there right off so that, you know, the weather can impact everybody living beyond it. Whereas it had never did before. It's all right to, you know, one person said it was all right. You can, you can discharge toxins into waters so that you can kill all, everything in the water, including the people who drink it. One person did that. So one person does make a difference everywhere. You know, if you think you're insignificant in this world, you're not. Yeah, it's always good to hear Edith. I'm glad I played the whole thing for you. It's uh, some good um, good words to, to remember. So um, there was a, a sulfide mine at Lac de Flambeau. Um, the mine operated for 10 years. It closed for 10 years and there's still contamination and violations of the Clean Water Act. There's still ongoing lawsuits and the certificate of completion is not yet finished. And this mine has been closed for more than 10 years. Um, there was a proposed copper and zinc mine, um, which would have been the largest open, uh, no, not open pit. It would have been the largest sulfide mine in North America had it been approved. It was an Exxon mine that uh, became a hot potato. It went from Exxon to Rio Algum to Billiton to BHP. Um, and Rio Tinto zinc, I think it was in there at one point. And um, eventually uh, the Mole Lake Ojibwe and the Forest County Potawatomi bought the mine site so that it could never be mined. Uh, one of the um, ongoing threats is uh, a proposed CAFO, a concentrated animal feed operation, if you're a proponent of large farms, factory farms, if you're not. Um, the plan was to relocate uh, a farm with 26,000 pigs, which would generate 6.5 billion gallons of manure annually. And the plan, the environmental plan, um, what's really interesting is that these uh, operations fall under agriculture laws um, and are treated as a farm, although some people would say that it's more factory conditions. But the, um, the environmental plan to to, for the, the manure was to liquefy it without treating it and spread it on farm fields, which just uh, made a lot of people cringe. Um, and this, uh, it, it was uh, going to be located near Fish Creek, which is uh, a tributary of the of Lake, uh, it was a tributary that drained into Shawamigan Bay and Lake Superior. And um, the status of this proposal is really uncertain. And then, um, then there was a 22 mile long taconite mine that Edith uh, was referring to during the, that boat trip that you just watched. Um, Gogebeck pulled out when taconite prices went th through the, the floor, um, they plummeted. And, uh, but they still own the mineral rights. So we're not sure what's gonna happen. But the big story right now is line five. Uh, in the news right now, um, 
645 miles long. It starts at Superior, Wisconsin. It uh, travels through Wisconsin, Michigan, uh, travels under the Straits of Mackinac, uh, and then returns to Canada. The pipeline, other sections of it, uh, west of Wisconsin start, it, it, it starts in Alberta tar sands basically um, in Alberta and, and starts in Canada, ends in Canada. It was built in 1953 with a 50 year life expectancy. It's now 64 years old. It's crossing rivers, wetlands and culturally significant sites. Um, Bad River, uh, the leases ran out in 2013, Bad River has been trying to get Enbridge to leave. The company keeps offering more and more money. Um, started out at a million and now they're up to 24 million. And the, the tribe is trying to explain to them there's no amount of money that, will, <laughs> that you can offer. We're not going to accept any money. We want you to shut the, 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 stop the flow, shut the pipe down, dig up the pipe, remediate the, the trench and leave. But they won't. Um, so uh, two years ago, our tribe sued them. And uh, now the state of Michigan has sued them as well. Um, there was a May, Gretchen Whitmer, the governor of Michigan set a May 12th deadline for um, Enbridge to shut the pipe down. It refused and now Michigan is threatening to seize its profits. And, um, and I want, uh, there's a, an excerpt of a Vox, uh, no, a Vice documentary um, that I think really kind of sets out the problem and why we should be concerned about this. Enbridge has an extensive pipeline network running through the Great Lakes region, and one pipeline in particular running through the Great Lakes themselves. Line 5 travels from Superior, Wisconsin through the Upper Peninsula of Michigan and then splits into two 20-inch pipelines as it crosses the five-mile-wide strait between Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. The twin pipelines follow the contours of the lake bottom, reaching depths of over 200 feet. It's 61 years old. It's never been replaced. It's owned and operated by Enbridge, which is the same company responsible for the largest inland oil spill in history. So you've got the iconic image of the Great Lakes, and right almost directly underneath it, there's this ticking time bomb. This is what an oil spill would look like in the Straits of Mackinac. The colored dots show where the oil would travel within the lake's water tables. Red is near surface, yellow, mid-depth, blue, near bottom. The oil would travel far, fast, and in different directions. Already, after six days, these surface particles are down, heading into Rogers City, uh, 40 miles away from the Straits. Dave Schwab, a research scientist at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor, created the computer models. I met with him to find out why the Straits were especially vulnerable to an oil spill. It's just this picture where it really spreads out there. I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't run enough oil boom no. across to get any of this. And that's a consequence of this oscillating flow that's so powerful. The amount of water going through that strait when it's going one direction or the other at the peak is more than 10 times what goes over Niagara Falls. If only one of the aging pipelines in the Straits of Mackinac were to rupture and Enbridge was able to shut down the pipeline immediately, the best case scenario would be a 1.5 million gallon oil spill. We could find out very little about the pipeline. We just basically knew it was there. Um, in the age. When was this line last inspected? What, did, what were the results of that inspection? Uh, that's basic information the public should have and we just, we cannot get. We had filed two FOIAs that were ignored for the large part. The FOIAs were asking for inspections. We know that Enbridge went down and took footage, but they weren't releasing the footage. And we, we weren't getting it from the federal agency, FEMSA. Finally, we decided we're going to just dive it. And when we got out there, it was Shocking. National Wildlife Federation divers captured footage of what many fear. He's in the water. Broken structural braces. And the pipelines covered in debris. But as the crew lowered their cameras deeper than they were able to dive, what they captured was truly worrisome. Sections of pipeline completely unsupported at a depth of over 200 feet. The 
emerge as an so um yeah keep your eye on that that's that's an ongoing story um the state of michigan has sued it's, it's going to impound the profits uh for every day enbridge stays open enbridge has said um uh, it's seeking federal redress and um so it's definitely something to watch legal approaches when um when native nations are confronted with environmental just injustice or are in danger of becoming sacrifice zones. Um, these are some of the tools they use, their, their sovereignty, their, treat, their treaty rights, treatment as a state status, and internationally, there's a movement growing called rights of nature. Treatment as a state is, um, it's a, a section of the Clean Air and Clean Water Acts of the 1970s. Um, regulatory authority, including over non-Indians on a reservation. Remember allotment? We have a lot of non-Native people living on our reservations now. Regular authority may be delegated to an Indian nation under the Clean Air and Clean Water Acts. An Indian nation with treatment as a state status is treated the same as a state for purposes of the Clean Air or Clean Water Acts. So an Indian nation with TAS can take authority for all delegable portions of the act um, or for certain sections. So this is something that um, many of the nations in the Upper Great Lakes region have been trying to acquire. It's quite a lengthy process. It took Bad River more than 10 years to get our TAS status for air and water. Um, but it's something that tribes are increasingly looking to acquire. At the international level, there's a movement called Rights of Nature, which acknowledges that nature in all its life forms has the right to exist, persist, maintain, and regenerate its vital cycles. And, you know, there are nations that have um, adopted or are considering Rights of Nature laws. These include Ecuador, New Zealand, um, uh, the government of New Zealand granted personhood to the Wanganui River at the request of the Maori, the indigenous Maori people. Um, same is true in some places in Australia where the Aboriginal people, the First Nations people there have um, petitioned the, the government to extend protection to certain sacred areas. The White Earth and Anishinaabe, the Ojibwe there have um, acknowledged personhood uh, and rights of nature to, to wild rice, to Monoman. And um, the Ho-Chunk Nation is also considering a rights of nature uh, tribal ordinance. Um, one of my favorite authors, Robin Kimmerer, uh, remarks in the book that everybody loves nature. Oh, we love walks on the beach. We love walking in the forest. But what if we truly believed that nature loved us back? How would that change our behavior? I mean, certainly we're still going to, you know, presumably, you know, unless you're a vegetarian, you're still going to eat animals, you're still going to gather plants and eat plants, but maybe we'd be, we'd be more mindful about um, what we consumed and we'd express more gratitude. And I think this is, you know, the other thing I'll close with was something that Chief Orrin Lyons, who's a, um, a faith keeper for the turtle clan of the Onondaga nation in New York. I was at a, an environmental conference with him and um, we were talking about resources and relationships. And he asked every, there were native and non-native people in the audience. And he asked us all to look out the window and he said, what do you see? And one of the state department of natural resources people said, well, trees and, nature, bushes, grass, flowers. And Orrin Lyons just kind of nodded and he said, oh, that's interesting. I see relatives. And I'll leave you with that thought. Um, everybody loves nature, but what if we believe that nature loved us back? How would we act in a, a responsible, uh, reciprocal way and, and express gratitude for the things that, um, give up their lives so that we can survive and thrive and persist. 
So uh, you have these resources. I'm going to stop sharing right now. And I think we have some time for questions. Uh, we certainly do. Uh, can you hear me, Patty? I can. Excellent. Uh, first of all, I think I speak for everyone. Uh, the way you have linked uh, sort of multidisciplinary research with the spiritual uh, and, and making it very clear that they are an integral whole with each other, uh, I think is one important message to take from this. Um, so we have quite a few questions. Uh, let's see if I can get my chat screen up. Yeah. So uh, let's start with uh, uh, Jerry Farinas. Uh, you were mentioning language. I was very much interested in language because of my own experience being part of the first generation of Hawaii public school students required to have Hawaiian culture and language curricula in elementary schools before the language could die out. I wish Wisconsin and Illinois schools had the same. Yeah. Yeah, you know, the, the native experience in, um, among native Hawaiians is very similar. And, um, you know, the, the land issues are very much the same. The language issues are, are much the same. Um, the, some of the tribes, I, I think I mentioned last week that the Ho-Chunk Nation has a really interesting language apprentice program. And now they have uh, so many, um, well, so relatively, <laughs> relative to other Indian nations in Wisconsin, they have quite a few new language speakers and they have been placing those language speakers in high schools, offering them to um, public schools in the 12 counties in which they have communities. And um, Hochangra Ho now is being offered as a foreign language in those public schools. So, you know, it is being done probably not to the extent it, sh it should. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really quite concerned for the Menominee. They are such a small tribe and, you know, they have 10,000 members, that's it and eight speakers and the likelihood that their language won't go dormant is I think pretty small. Um, the next question comes from Holly M. Um, what is the appropriate least offensive term to use when referring to people of indigenous heritage? <laughs> Native Americans, First Nations, First Peoples, indigenous people, American Indians? Yes, yes, yes and yes. Um, <laughs> I think it's really situational. You know, if you call my mom an American Indian, she may just, you know, hit you with an upper uppercut. Um, she's 98 years old, so she probably wouldn't hurt you much. <laughs> but, um, but you know, it really offends her. Um, and I keep telling her mom, you know, it our legal name on our treaties that we signed with the federal government is the Bad River Band of Lake Superior Tribe of Chippewa Indians, and. You know, if you start messing around with your formal names, you know, does that mean the treaties could be nullified? I mean, that's a, it's a legitimate question to ask. My grandfather, he was fine with Indian. I interchange, I use First Nation. Well, I don't use First Nations unless I'm talking about Canada. I think they kind of, they co-opted that. And so when I hear First Nations, I immediately think of Can Canadian indigenous people. I think most of us would prefer to, to be um, addressed um, with our, our native nation name. So if you ask me, would, would I prefer to be called Indian or an indigenous? I would say, you know, I would rather you call me Ojibwe, but I realize that you have to speak in aggregate sometimes. And so I think the best thing is just to ask the indigenous person you're talking to what they prefer. Thank you. Um, next question, are there college and university level programs for language teachers? Yes, the University of um, Minnesota Duluth has an excellent program. The Haskell um, University of all, Haskell Indian University, there's an all, of all Indians, of all nations. Haskell in Kansas um, teaches Indian languages. Um, I, I took Ojibwe 
uh, language classes from a non-native Ojibwe teacher at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, so there, you can find languages, la native language programs, um, usually in states that have higher, uh, a disproportionate number of native people. For example, Arizona State, University of Washington, um, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan. Um, our, our center at, Nat at Northwestern um, sponsored Cherokee language classes um, that were held at the American Indian Center and the St. Kateri Center in, in Chicago. So that's something we, we definitely, at some point when we get a little bit larger and more, you know, more stable, th that's something that we're really interested in doing. But we want, you know, one of the ways that we approach our research in general is to ask native communities themselves to frame the kind of research that they want. But we have been told that language is one of those things. And so we're trying to figure out how to do it in the best way possible. Here's another question about language. You're right, that seems to be a yeah. very important topic. This is from Suzanne. Uh, are any English language speakers enrolled in immersion programs? Thinking about goals of Spanish immersion programs, biliteral, bilingual, bicultural. You know, I don't know the answer to that. I'm sure there probably are because there are non-native, pretty fluent speakers in some of the languages and um, I'm not sure where they learned them, but you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me if they were in an immersion program somewhere or just an immersion situation where they lived with somebody who was um, a first language speaker. Okay, how did people fish before headlamps? A question from Claire. Torches. In Torches. Fact, um, you know, my native name um, in Ojibwe is Waswakanokwe, which means uh, torchlight on the water woman. And so my name evokes um, spearfish, ancient spearfishing techniques where, you know, didn't have the, the minor lights, the lamps, the headlamps, um, but we had torches. And when you're spearfishing, you're looking the, you know, when the weather's, when the water hits 48 degrees, the male walleye come up and fertilize the eggs that the female walleye have, have laid. And they kind of, hang out in the shallows for a while. And that's when the Ojibwe take their spears and it's a very efficient way of harvesting. Um, the way you're able to see the fish at night it, with these torchlight is the eyes of the walleye look red underwater, bright red. And so that's how you're able to, to uh, know when to spear. Now, one of the things that I love is traditional ecological knowledge. And there's a really lovely story from the director of the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission who um, told me that he had been um, a warden, a conservation warden on the Lakota Ray Reservation. And he had just gotten his four year environmental science degree from the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. And he was in charge of opening up the lakes for spearfishing. So the water hit 48 degrees and he declared the water, you know, the lake open. And because of the court cases and all that, craziness that happened in the 1980s. It's very regulated. And it costs about $5,000 to open up a lake for spearfishing because you have all these wardens that are counting every fish and monitors and all sorts of things. So he, you know, 48 degrees, science says, open up the lake. And one of his old techs um, who didn't even have a high school education said, eh, no, I don't think the lake is ready yet because the frogs aren't chirping. And Mick said, frogs chirping, open up the lake. And there, there were no fish. And so the next week, same thing, 48 degrees, open up the lake. No, I don't think the lake is ready. There's, the buds aren't on the pussy willows yet. And it was only later, and, and again, once again, no fish. And, and, uh, uh, and he, he made a very expensive mistake opening up a lake that wasn't ready for, for spearfishing. And it was only a couple of weeks later when he, he himself is now spearing with his brother and uh, they're, the fish are really biting and they're, you know, they're just spearing fish, <laughs> getting their quota. And his brother says, what's that noise? And, and Mick goes, it's the frogs chirping. 
<laughs> so there's, you know, a lot of that wisdom out there. And, um, and one of the things that groups like Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission are trying to do is to meld that traditional ecological knowledge with the scientific ecological knowledge. There's an interesting comment from uh, Jean Smiling Coyote, uh, the origin of the name Lac du Flambeau probably Lake has of to, torches. Yeah, Lake of Torches. So uh, it's uh, linguistically anchored. Uh, what did the, uh, the spears look like before metal? Well, they were carved. They were, they were wooden and sharpened but they had the same kind of trident look, you know, the old spears had kind of a three pronged look to them. Um, and then, you know, the turn of the century, they, they switched over to metal. Um, and now everybody uses metal spears. We got a number of comments about uh, the riot that you yeah. showed a video from. Uh, uh, Jen writes, uh, the white entitlement to everything in this country is so absurd. Uh, Lauren writes, uh, seems like Native American history is almost completely absent from the educational curriculum in all states. Do you know of any federal or state level efforts to meaningfully include Native American history into the K to 12 <laughs> curriculum? Yeah, in fact, I'm gonna get my, my book. <laughs> Okay, product placement here. So um, Wisconsin, at, in, in response to that um, spearfishing violence, uh, the Wisconsin legislature passed a law in 1990, it took effect in 1991, that required that every Wisconsin school child learn Wisconsin Indian history, treaty rights, and sovereignty three times in the K-12 experience, and it set up certification standards for teachers but there weren't any materials out there. And so that's one of the things I did was I wrote this, well, I wrote a, um, a general, I don't wanna say the Wisconsin, uh, an adult book, cause that, that sounds really bad, but this book was my first book. And then teachers were using that and saying, we don't have any kids materials. And so then I wrote this one, which is used by, I don't know, 25,000 Wisconsin um, fourth and fifth graders. And I wrote it in collaboration with native elders and culture keepers and historians, each of the 12 communities. And, um, and then we wrote a teacher's guide as well. So um, Wisconsin has a law, although it's an unfunded mandate and so it's not evenly met throughout the state, but Montana also has um, a law that was really patterned after Wisconsin. And now I think they've pretty much exceeded what Wisconsin is doing in terms of materials and um, education for all, I think is what it's called. Um, I think the state of Washington has done a pretty, is, has, has done a, a, a better job, um, but tribes like, uh, or uh, states like Oklahoma that have more Indian nations than any other place in this, in this country still you know don't have to to the best of my knowledge at least the last time i checked they didn't have required curricula that's really shocking yeah it is um how did casinos become to uh, become so central in so many native Amer american communities a question from jen yeah that's a really good question so um a lot of people think the native uh american um the National Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, which was passed in, I think, 1987, um, allowed gaming. It actually limited gaming. Um, up until 19, the 1980s, there was no money circulating in Indian country at all. Um, Native people were frozen out of things like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Um, the, everything was very tightly controlled by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, tremendous poverty and um, very little acceptance of self-determination and the exercises of sovereignty. There were two tribes, the Seminole in Florida and the Cabazon um, in California that 
decided to offer high stakes bingo on their reservations as a way of generating some, some capital. And just to go back just for a moment, the reason why there's no money circulating is because our land is held in trust for us by the federal government. We don't own our own land. My, my grandfather's allotment, which has come down to me, I can't sell it. I can't, you know, I, I can't go to the bank and say, give me a loan. And they say, well, what's your collateral? And I say, well, I have this trust thing that I don't know. I mean, it can't be used as collateral. So there's no money. So then these two tribes decide that they're going to open up, uh, they're going to exercise their sovereignty. They're going to open up high stakes bingo. And the, the, they're the two states, California and and Florida quickly tried to shut them down. It wound up at the US Supreme Court and the US Supreme Court said, hey, tribes are sovereign. They, they have the right to determine their economic activities within their physical boundaries. And so Congress quickly passed the National Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, which set up this whole system where tribes have to, you, uh, a tribe can only offer gaming if it's in a state that has class three gaming and that would include like dog tracks and lotteries and that kind of thing. And, um, and so it set up these um, mechanisms by which tribes have to negotiate with the governors in these states. And since then, that's been kind of the, you know, the magic, the magic potion for, for tribes to, try to generate some, um, some funds. Not all tribes offer gaming and there are um, seven tribes in the country that, that generate something like 70 or 80% of all the, the profits from gaming. So, you know, my little tribe located between Ironwood, Michigan and Ashland, Wisconsin isn't exactly a destination point and our little casino offers employment and you know, generates a little bit of profit, but not much. Uh, I, I'm just on the housekeeping side, I wanted to point out that we either own or uh, can provide access to from partner libraries, uh, all of uh, Professor Lowe's books. And we're making sure now that Evanston Public Library has copies of books that we previously had to rely oh, on good. partner libraries to supply. Um, also, we're about to run out of time, and I just wanted to remind everyone that uh, questions that we don't get to, uh, we hope to uh, be able to circulate answers and, you know, Patty Lowe's comments to uh, in the next couple of days. You'll get that at your email address. But we do have some time for maybe two or three more questions. So uh, the next question comes from Marjorie Fujara. How does the federal government decide if a tribe should be federally recognized? Well, um, that was that that was a process that was determined through treaty making. If you sat down with the people and you recognized that they had the right to be swindled out of their land, <laughs> and presumably they owned it, um, or you thought they owned it because ownership was just conceived of in a different way in tribal communities. Um, that was, you know, if you signed a treaty with the federal government, you know, that was an ac implicit acknowledgement of your tribal sovereignty. Over the years, there is a process through the Bureau of Indian Affairs. You can go to the Office of Federal Acknowledgement and it shows the criteria that's used to determine whether a people are considered to be a sovereign people and can apply for that status. Um, there's 574 federally recognized tribes um, right now. But uh, go to the Office of Federal Acknowledgement at the Bureau of Indian Affairs and you can learn everything you, you ever want to know about that process. Question from Ireta Gassner. Has there ever been an attempt to de-link Native American tribes or its members from tax obligations? Um, well, Native people don't pay, uh, we don't pay state tax if we live on the reservation. I live off the reservation, so I pay tax to the state of Illinois. I pay federal income tax. Native people pay federal income tax. They don't pay state tax. Um, some tribes have exercised their right to tax. Most don't. Um, 
some money is generated through fishing license taxes and that sort of thing. Um, but uh, most of us pay some kind of tax. Uh, Lauren has asked if you have recommendations for where to buy or order wild rice cultivated in Wisconsin, uh, or the best way to support wild rice cultivation. Yeah. Because uh, the options, this would be something that you know, we can put in the chat and uh, come yeah, up with. Mo the Mole Lake Reservation sells wild rice, um, limited amounts. Bad River's kind of stingy, you kind of have to go there and visit and you'll see the big wild rice stand, you know, there, there you'll see signs outside people's um, houses, wild rice for sale. Um, if you see um, a sign that says wild rice and it's under $10 a pound, you're not buying actual real wild okay. rice because the processing, the hand harvesting, hand processing, hand winnowing is a four day, four day process. And that rice sells for between 10 and $15 a pound. You can buy it, um, support environmental um, initiatives through Winona LaDuke's um, nonprofit uh, called Native Harvest. Um, it's wild rice that's coming off the White Earth Reservation in Michigan. It's a great organization. You can also find it, um, order it online through Binishi, B-I-N-E-S-H-I-I. -I. Um, that is another native owned um, collective operating off the Leech Lake Reservation in Minnesota. A uh, question from Claire, and I think we can take two questions and this is the first of those. With copper and other metals playing a big part in batteries for electric vehicles and other things, what new threats do Northern, does Northern Wisconsin face? Yeah, I didn't know that the, the copper was, was an issue, but you know, copper and zinc, th these are minerals that are found in Northern Wisconsin. So that is always gonna be a threat to us. Um, taconite as well. But I thought lithium was the big um, uh, boogeyman in, um, in electric car batteries. I may be wrong, but that was my understanding. And a lot of the lithium is coming from lithium brine in Argentina and Chile and maybe Bolivia, I think. Somewhere, there are three nations in South America and there are some indigenous uh, communities that are very concerned about their water supply. So, you know, it's really hard to know what to do. You know, you're a young parent, you use disposable diapers and then they wind up in a landfill. Some of them are biodegradable now, but you know, they're gonna wind up in a landfill or do you use cloth diapers? Hey, that's a better alternative or is it? Cause you're using hot water and energy. You know, it's really difficult to know what the ethical thing to do is. And, you know, when it comes to batteries and electric cars, I have to admit, I'm, I'm really conflicted. Last question uh, from Monica G. Are there funds to help support tribes purchase land to prevent that land from being used for mining? I think if you go to most tribal websites, you might see a donate button, um, legal defense funds. Almost everybody is under threat from some, you know, uh, corporate activity. And um, the, you know, some tribes lost more of their land through the allotment process than others. My tribe only lost 60% of our land. And we were able to, um, because of a really creative deal with the Nature Conservancy and land that became available uh, when international paper got out of the forest management part of paper making and to focus on the actual paper making. It put up millions of acres of land for sale. And some of that was part of our original reservation. So the Nature Conservancy took an option. We worked with them, we were able to get a mortgage and we now own that land outright. And it's back, it's been rolled back into trust again. And people you know, wanted to know, well, what are you gonna do with it? And it was like, what do you mean? What are we gonna do with it? We're just gonna, it's just gonna be, it doesn't have to do anything. It can just be, can be habitat for wild rice and birds and you know fish and, um, but white earth 
uh, lost 90% of its land through the allotment process. And by buying wild rice through native harvest, if you go to nativeharvest.org, um, when you're buying rice from them, that money is, it's a nonprofit and it's going back to purchase land and buy back the land on the reservation. So that would be a really good thing to do. Once again- And you get to eat good rice too. <laughs> Yeah, it's important to know the value of something and then to pay for that value yeah. and how that supports the entire food chain. Um, that was our last question. However, um, you will be receiving an email of uh, the chat log with uh, mm -hmm. more answers. And I want to take this opportunity to thank you, Patty, for uh, very patiently answering the questions posed in our first session last week. And I, this is quite an ordeal that we're putting through. I see there are 20 new messages <laughs> that we haven't gotten to, uh, but uh, I, I promise that we will take the clerical part of that off your shoulders. Well, Jeffrey, I do wanna say, um, I, I uh, promised to do a program review for the School of Communication over the next three days. And it's like nine o'clock in the morning to 5 p.m. or 10, 10 to five with no breaks. And so I, I probably won't be able to get to the questions as quickly as I did the first time. Well, that is just fine. And I know the answers will be appreciated uh, whenever. So. But thank you so much for your generosity, yeah, uh, for thank your you. expertise, for the Native American perspective on these issues. And uh, it's been really wonderful. Uh, so thank you. And uh, everyone, thank you for coming this evening. Uh, stay tuned for next year's schedule of mini courses. <laughs> I feel like I need to acknowledge advertisers here, but Evanston Public Library and the Northwestern Emeriti Organization and we wish you all a, a very good evening and uh, take to heart many of the things that were said today and last week. So thank you. Thank you, Patty, and thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.